This episode is sponsored by Simply Safe, an award-winning home security system. If you've been thinking about getting a security system, now is the time. You can save big on Simply Safe with up to 40% off new system orders. Head to simplysafe.com/babish or click the link in the video description to save up to 40% on your Simply Safe system during their biggest sale of the year. Excuse me, sir. Would you like to try a Thanksgiving bowl? It is an entire meal of turkey, stuffing, mashed potatoes with gravy, string beans, cranberry sauce, pumpkin pie, and an Andy's mint rolled into a bowl, battered and deep fried. Dude, you didn't ask him any questions. This is true, but it's clear he likes our balls. <laughs> balls. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're taking a look at the Thanksgiving balls from Psych, which, being an entire Thanksgiving dinner rolled into a ball and deep fried, necessitates that we make an entire Thanksgiving dinner. We got a lot to do and only about 10 minutes to do it, so I'm not going to waste any time. First, a single flawless sheet of parchment paper, which we're going to crumple up into a ball. This not only makes it look like garbage, discouraging theft, but it's going to make a great liner for our store bought pie shell. That's right, it's a frozen pie shell. I was going to make my own, but then I remembered that we're going to mash this thing into a ball. So now we're lining it with our crinkly parchment paper, filling it to the rim with pie weights or pie beans, par baking per the package parameters, removing the pie beans, and returning to the oven to bake until golden brown. So there you have it, a store-bought pie shell. Let's pretend that we made this all on our own, allowing it to cool completely while we prepare the specified filling. Into a bowl goes half a cup each granulated sugar and light brown sugar, tablespoon flour, half teaspoon ground ginger, quarter teaspoon allspice, quarter teaspoon nutmeg, teaspoon of cinnamon, half teaspoon kosher salt, two eggs cracked simultaneously for spectacle, one can of pumpkin puree, two teaspoons of vanilla paste, and one cup of heavy cream. Whip with a wire whisk until smooth, and just like that, you got pumpkin pie base. Pour into the prepared pastry, and this guy's ready to bake at 375 for 25 to 30 minutes until just set but very wobbly, then turning off the oven and allowing the pie to cool completely in the off oven, which is going to cool the custard down gradually and prevent it from cracking. You going to close the oven door there, Andy? Oh, never mind. Ghost's got it. Next up, stuffing. Now we have a stuffing basics coming out next week. Keep an eye out for that. So we'll save the fancy stuffing for then. For now, we're just drying out a loaf of bread cut into one-inch cubes in a low oven or left out overnight. Then over on the stovetop, we're browning a pound of sage sausage, then half a small chopped onion, letting that sweat for three to five minutes, adding one clove crushed garlic, teaspoon of rosemary, tablespoon of fresh sage, sauteing for about 30 more seconds or until fragrant, and then dumping over our dried bread cubes. Then we're starting to add stock, at first about a cup, starting to soak the bread and cool off the meat and veg so that we can add one beaten egg, then mixing and slowly adding stock until the desired consistency is achieved. Pour into a buttered cast iron skillet and roast. 375 for 30 to 45 minutes until lightly browned and cooked through. Now for the green beans, I didn't want to do the usual green bean casserole. I wanted to try something else. Green beans, amandine. We're starting by parboiling the green beans for three to four minutes while we melt three tablespoons of butter and one tablespoon of olive oil in a large skillet. Once hot and foamy, we're adding a quarter cup of slivered almonds, letting those toast for about two minutes before adding two cloves of thinly sliced garlic. Saute for about 30 seconds or until fragrant before skimming the green beans out of the water and dumping them straight in. Saute everything to Together for another one to two minutes. Ooh cool flames, then season to taste with freshly ground salt and kosher pepper. Now I am a green bean casserole obsessive, and I gotta say this is a pretty good option in a pinch. Only takes about 15 minutes and less than 10 ingredients. Next up, a nice and simple Yukon Gold Mash. Peeling and cutting three large Yukon Golds into one inch cubes, covering them with cold water, adding two cloves of garlic and a sprig of thyme, bringing to a boil and cooking for about 15 minutes, until the potatoes can be passively pierced with a paring knife. Then I'm returning the potatoes to low heat and cooking them for about 30 seconds to drive off excess moisture before seasoning them with white pepper, kosher salt, and adding one cup of steaming milk and four tablespoons of melted butter. Mash to a state of mashedness, taste for seasoning, and it's time for turkey. We don't need much, so I'm just doing a leg that I'm going to place on a rack over a bed of mirepoix, helping to prevent fat from dripping down and burning, and there's going to be a lot of it. Got one cup of butter here that I'm adding various spices to, garlic powder, onion powder, cayenne pepper, white pepper, kosher salt, and I'm going to use this to base the bird. First giving it a healthy initial brushing before placing into a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven, preferably with convection for anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, taking it out to baste it every 15 or so and making sure to rotate it so that it gets even heat. Eventually we're just looking for the skin to be brown and for the meat to register at least 175 degrees Fahrenheit at its thickest point. And for a last minute small scale Thanksgiving option, it's pretty good. You got nice crispy skin, juicy meat, but none of it means anything without cranberry sauce. One pound of fresh cranberries, cup of water, cinnamon stick, star anise pod, freshly grated nutmeg, zest and juice of one orange. Get it up to a simmer and hold it there for about 30 minutes. Fish out your star anise and your cinnamon stick and there you go. Next and last we're just going to make some fortified turkey stock. As you can see here, I have a turkey pope's nose, which my butcher was kind enough to give me. To that, I'm going to add a quartered onion, some fresh thyme, parsley, and sage, and a chopped carrot and celery. Once that's got a little bit of color on it, we're going to add some turkey stock, taking care not to spill a drop. 
perfect. Once you've covered the vegetables with turkey stock and cleaned up your cooktop, we're gonna bring this to a simmer and cook for at least 45 minutes, making our boxed stock taste less like a box and more like stock. The next day, everything's cooled off and therefore has become leftovers, which we must now coax into ball form with, of course, some Andy's mints. First up, I forgot to make the gravy, so real quick, we wanna put about half a cup of fat in a pan. I'm using butter and our reserved turkey drippings. And to that, we're gonna add half a cup of all-purpose flour, whisking and cooking for one to three minutes until the raw flour smell dissipates and then slowly adding in splashes of our stock, whisking to a state of smoothness after each addition. Oop, don't forget those turkey drippings. And this stuff came out pretty thick and pretty pale, so I'm gonna darken it and flavor it both with soy sauce and a little bit of gravy master. I'm also gonna season it with kosher salt, freshly ground pepper, and nutmeg. I know I'm kind of the nutmeg guy, but nutmeg and gravy really actually works. If you don't like it, fill out the rebate form, send me your gravy, and I will mail you a replacement in three to five weeks. Give it a taste for seasoning, and then since it's getting mashed into ball form, we need to cool it off. I'm spreading it out on a rim baking sheet, placing it in the fridge, and while it's cooling, I'm going to peel the skin off of and shred our dark turkey meat. Once it's shredded down to a nice form factor, we can start assembling. Now, my first instinct was to sort of take a flap of stuffing, then place the turkey, gravy, cranberry sauce, green beans, pumpkin pie, and of course, Andy's mint in the center. Then I imagine the stuffing wrapping around these fillings, keeping them safe as we turn this thing into a scotch egg, patting out some mashed potatoes into a disc and ensconcing the stuffing ball within it, creating an all-inclusive Thanksgiving snowball. But then a much more practical idea came to mind. Why not arrange all the fillings on a table and go full cold stone creamery on them, chopping and folding them together like common mix-ins on an admittedly not refrigerated table. Then grabbing a handful of the sort of grisly looking end product and much more easily shaping it into a ball that can then be wrapped in mashed potatoes, of course. Now, it seems like we have our bases pretty covered, but I'm sorry to say that my ideas did not stop there. Yep, I am very sorry to say that this is happening. We are going to consciously make the decision to put every element of a Thanksgiving dinner in a food processor, stare unblinkingly into the void, and blend into a Thanksgiving paste. Let's all just silently reflect for a moment while we watch this liquefy. Do you see what you guys make me do? And now, obviously, I have to try it. Thanksgiving paste food product. Thanksgiving of the future. Come on, Andy, don't be a wimp. It's just normal food mashed together. Just eat it. And I gotta say, it's actually really, really good. I'm kidding. It's not good at all. It's like extra lumpy, grainy, Thanksgiving flavored mashed potatoes. That being said, we have to try to make something out of it. You can't just throw it away. I mean, when you look into the void, after all, it looks back. So next stage is to batter and deep fry these things. So I'm setting up a two-stage battering system, combining one cup of cornstarch, quarter cup of flour, and a teaspoon of kosher salt in one vessel, and one and a half cups flour, and a teaspoon of baking powder in another, perhaps slightly larger vessel, to which we're going to add three cups of light beer-style lager, creating an ethereal beer batter that must be used immediately. That is, after whisking to a consistency of about lumpy pancake batter. So first our balls are getting thoroughly coated in the cornstarch mixture, patting off any excess, then they're going for a bath in the wet stuff, and once completely coated, they're headed over to the stovetop where we have some 350 degree Fahrenheit oil ready to receive. It's very hard to not lose some batter in the process, so don't beat yourself up, and fry for four to five minutes until deeply golden brown. And hopefully heat it through. I'm starting with our gobstopper ball, then frying our cold stone creamery balls, no more than two at a time because they're basically giant ice cubes in the oil. Then I'm frying our heart of darkness paste that I've rolled into little balls and coated with breadcrumbs, which I quickly discovered exploded, which is understandable. They are not of this realm. So I'm fortifying the paste with eggs and breadcrumbs and likewise battering before deep frying. I refuse to liquefy a Thanksgiving dinner for nothing. We are getting some balls out of it. Once those are golden brown and crisp, just like everybody else, we are draining on paper towels. And then finally, it's time to rack them up and taste test. First up, the little fritters of darkness. And they obviously look amazing inside, but how do they taste? And the answer is not good, but not bad. Sort of like a cornless hush puppy that had a nightmare about Thanksgiving last night. Then the gobstopper, which is kind of cool. You can see every element, including the melty Andes mint, but it's a little unwieldy and the chocolate is too pronounced. The real winner here was the Cold Stone version. The chocolate was chopped in, so wasn't overbearing. You can taste a little bit of Thanksgiving in every bite. Plus, it's deep fried. You might laugh, but it was the only one that I had to cut into pieces so that everybody could try it. Thanks again to Simply Safe for sponsoring this episode. Between the quick and easy setup and the affordable monthly monitoring plan, it's clear that there is no safe like Simply Safe. When I'm traveling a lot during the holidays, it gives me peace of mind to know that my home is protected. There's no long term contracts or hidden fees, and right now you can save big with up to 40% off new system orders during their biggest sale of the year. For more info and to get your own, head to simplysafe.com/babish or click the link in the video description.